We've seen a lot of violent protests and senseless slaughter over the past couple of weeks. More than 50 people have been killed and hundreds injured in such bastions of tolerance and human rights as Libya, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. What's the source of all this indiscriminate bloodshed? Four words. The Bill of Rights. More specifically, the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech and freedom of religion to U.S. citizens. I'm definitely not alone when I say that this document must be stopped before it kills again. The largest Muslim organization in the world, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, has called for international laws banning expressions of Islamophobia, as have the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar University, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, the presidents of Indonesia and Pakistan, and many American Muslim leaders. But Muslims aren't the only ones who want to see the Bill of Rights go up in smoke faster than U.S. Embassy after a new Muhammad film. Celebrities like Bed Midler and Russell Simmons support Sharia blasphemy laws, and both USA Today and the LA Times have published articles calling for legal restrictions on criticism of Muhammad. Now, my family has been fighting for this country since the American Revolutionary War, but I'm man enough to admit that we've taken our freedoms too far. Americans have used our freedom to make Muslims feel bad, putting certain Muslims in the awkward position of having to choose between behaving like adults and throwing violent tantrums. There's only one solution to this crisis that we've caused. We must put an end to Muhammad films, Muhammad cartoons, Muhammad books, and anything else that might hurt the feelings of any one of the world's 1.5 billion Muslims. Obviously, we're going to have to take this in a legal direction, and I propose a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that would abolish the First Amendment. But the legal route might take a few years, so in the meantime, we'll need to be responsible adults and self-enforce Sharia blasphemy laws. The Greek philosopher Aristotle pointed out that if you have a bent stick, you can straighten it by bending it in the opposite direction. He applied this to his ethics. If you're too stingy with your money, try being overly generous for a while in order to break your old habit. Americans have been too harsh with Muhammad, so following Aristotle, we should probably try to be extremely nice and respectful towards Islam's prophet, at least until we've lost all respect for the First Amendment. Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. Let me show you how to talk about Muhammad respectfully. Here in the West, we value tolerance, but if we value tolerance, we shouldn't criticize Muhammad because he was the embodiment of tolerance. Consider a few of Muhammad's peaceful teachings. Fight those who believe not in Allah. O oh, you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the Scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah. O oh, you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. I will expel the Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula and will not leave any but Muslims. Is a man who would utter such beautiful words the sort of person we should be mocking in YouTube videos? Or is he someone whose words are beyond reproach? I think the answer is obvious. But if I haven't convinced you yet, I invite you to consider some of Muhammad's teachings about women. The savior and liberator of all of women's rights. Muhammad was probably the greatest champion of women's rights the world has ever seen. He liberated women.
by commanding his followers to beat rebellious wives into submission, and by beating his wife Aisha, and by declaring that women are the property of men, and by saying that the testimony of a woman is worth half that of a man, and by saying that women are intellectually deficient, and by allowing his followers to rape their female captives, and by bringing the most beautiful captive back to his own tent, and by having sex with his slave girl, Mary the Copt, and by letting his followers hire prostitutes when they didn't have captives, because nothing says champion of women's rights like giving a woman a handful of food in exchange for the temporary use of her vagina. Now, do we really want to criticize the teachings of one of the greatest feminists of all time? Here again, I think the answer is obvious. The future must not belong to those who bully women. It must be shaped by girls who go to school and those who stand for a world where our daughters can live their dreams just like our sons. As if his teachings on tolerance and women's rights weren't enough, we're also confronted with Muhammad's tremendous spiritual power. Jews read about Moses parting the Red Sea, and Christians read about Jesus rising from the dead. But that's nothing compared to Muhammad. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad's first impression of his revelations was that they were demonic. According to Muslim sources, after he began receiving revelations, Muhammad became suicidal and tried to hurl himself off a cliff. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad delivered revelations to his followers promoting polytheism, but he came back later and blamed the devil for tricking him. According to Muslim sources, Muhammad was the victim of a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. Obama! Obama! We love Osama! The next time you make fun of someone, make fun of someone bad. Don't make fun of someone like Muhammad. A man who had sex with a nine-year-old girl and married more women than his own revelations allowed and married the wife of his own adopted son? A man who advocated idolatrous pagan practices like kissing the black stone and bowing down to the Kaaba? A man who tortured people for money and assassinated people for criticizing his religion? A man who supported his religion by robbing people and taught his followers to believe in a God who loves only them and no one else? If we are serious about these ideals, we must speak honestly about the deeper causes of the crisis. There are two paths to greatness, my friends. The first path to greatness is to actually be great, to do great things, to live a life people can't help but admire. The second path is to convince a bunch of mindless thugs to slaughter anyone who says you're not great. Eventually, everyone, even people who don't believe in you, will be so terrified of offending your followers, they'll call you great. They'll call you prophet. They'll call your book holy. The Holy Quran. The Holy Quran. The Holy Quran. Like it or not, my friends, it's pointless to make fun of Muhammad. No matter how hard you try, you'll never be able to say more horrible things about Muhammad than his own followers said about him in Islam's most trusted sources. The things I read about Muhammad in the Quran and the Hadith and the Sirah and the Tafsir, I wouldn't say them about my worst enemy. Surely a man who's been paraded around by his followers in such a despicable manner deserves our deepest sympathy, not our ridicule. Tears of a rapper. Don't wanna make a rapper cry, then watch what you say. What, what, what? You told me to say, don't make fun of Muhammad, and that's exactly what I said. I have the video proof.